The real um, uh, tragic contribution that I made uh, was that I took Al Qaeda's message and I transformed it so that it would appeal to Americans. Welcome to Global Perspectives. This week, I'm so happy to be bringing to you Jesse Morton, who is the founder and head of Parallel Networks, an organization combating hate and extremism. Jesse also is research fellow at George Washington University's program on extremism. Jesse was once a prominent Islamist radicalizer here in the United States, where he helped insert the narrative of Al Qaeda into the American ambit. Rarely do we have the opportunity to go inside the brain of a former radical Islamist, indeed one who helped recruit others to the cause. Join me for Jesse's insights on the inner workings of the terror recruitment process and the implications of all this for us in the West. Jesse Curtis Morton was born in Pennsylvania 37 years ago, but he came from an abusive household and was in and out of jail as a young man on drug and other charges. He came into contact with radical Islamists and co-founded a group called Revolution Muslim in 2008. Jesse Morton, it's wonderful to have you with me on Global Perspectives. Nice to meet you, Ellie, and thank you for having me. Jesse, I want to start our conversation with your experience in the U.S. prison system. At that point, you had been uh, already exposed to Islam, I think, in a very um, elementary kind of way. And tell us who you met in the prison system and what that experience was. You know, I was haphazardly incarcerated in a city in the United States, Richmond, Virginia. Uh, Richmond, Virginia is home to a pretty big Muslim population, particularly an immigrant Muslim population. And an individual who was incarcerated for fighting uh, it was a, a veteran of the Afghan Soviet Jihad. So me being an elementary student interested in Islam, uh, he developed a rapport with me, uh, was very interested in me as a Caucasian convert in particular, uh, and uh, started to teach me the basic tenets of the religion. But at one point, uh, the individual uh, started to transition into broader conversations uh, through conversation about the scientific compatibility of the Quran uh, with modern science. That transitioned into me being told that now that I learned uh, how to pray in Arabic, I could officially become a real Muslim. I was told to go wash every inch of my body and that when I came out, I would be given the testimony of faith and everything that I had done before in my life would be beginning brand new and I would be given a new identity. And I was given the name Yunus Abdullah Muhammad from Jonah uh, in the Bible or in the uh, Old Testament that uh, was the prophet that was swallowed by the whale, spit back out and then called the people of Nineveh uh, to uh, monotheistic uh, religion. Um, that in the context of a previous interest in the autobiography of Malcolm X and an ambition to become a radical activist due to my far leftism that preceded Islam, uh, largely made me open up to broader conversations about political Islam. One day we were praying in the back of the cell block and a Christian woke up uh, because we had called the early morning prayer and had awoken him and he stood in front of the prayer to prevent us from praying. The individual, the Moroccan veteran of the Afghan Soviet Jihad, tried to move him gently to the right. He did not move. Uh, so he stood up and fought him. And that physical altercation was my first contact with the concept that violence could be any part of a spiritual or religious tradition. It was foreign to me. So when I asked him exactly why, he quoted a hadith that's narrated uh, in the authentic books of uh, a hadith according to the Muslims that says that the Prophet said, the Prophet Muhammad said that if someone comes and stands in front of your prayer, then gently move them to the right with your hand. And if they don't, then get up and fight them for verily they are a devil. Uh, this was quite a, sort of confusing to me. But then he explained to me that there was prophetic scriptures that were about to be fulfilled. This is the era, and this is about six months before 9-11, uh, that the black flag would be raised in Khorasan, that's understood by Islamists to be Afghanistan. And the black flag is distinguished from the white flag in the sense that it is the flag of war or of jihad. So here you were uh, getting converted to a certain kind of Islam by someone who had fought in the Middle East. And, uh, and so he starts to talk to you about more political Islam. And, uh, and eventually, if I know your story correctly, 
um, manages to recruit you to uh, jihadi Islam. What I wanted to ask you, Jesse, is how common do you think this kind of pattern is in the U.S. prison system? Well, in the in the U.S. prison system, I will say that there is a prevalence of political Islam. Now, that does not mean that conversations in prison are not held that are political, because going from a criminal lifestyle into a re level of literalism paints that us versus them black and white perspective that those types of brains uh, are predisposed to. And so that can facilitate radicalization in so many ways. And so this is what takes place in, in the prison where you are. Eventually you come out, you kind of become a new person. You um, pursue a degree at Columbia University. You kind of completely change your life and clean up your life for the better. But unfortunately, at the same time, you've become completely radicalized and you now are recruiting other uh Islamic radical extremists. Is that correct? It is. Uh, I got out uh, after being uh, radicalized by uh, the uh, inmates, uh, totally transformed my life. As you said, then 9-11 happened. And instead of choosing, you know, us, I chose the terrorists uh, due to a number of factors, including the radicalization that occurred during the period of my incarceration. Jesse, tell us a little bit because you were s uh, stunningly successful in in this new persona so um could you tell us uh, a bit about this tragic if i may say success that you had in recruiting others to your new cause of terrorism so i brought to the table an american mindset in a period when propaganda from jihadist was largely tailored toward a middle eastern audience and what i did as a white blue-eyed american that converted I gave them somebody to hold up and say, we have one of your own. Uh, I was a pretty gifted speaker, but the real um, uh, tragic contribution that I made uh, was that I took Al Qaeda's message and I transformed it so that it would appeal to Americans. And they told us that Americans were exceptional in the sense that American Muslims could not be radicalized because they had higher levels of educa education, employment, assimilation than their uh, European counterparts. We kind of proved that the ideology knows no demographic uh, and uh, in so many ways uh, set forth a template for radicalization and recruitment that ISIS later adopted. We designed the English language jihadist magazines that uh, were described in the press as Al Qaeda in Vanity Fair. Uh, we took a lot of glossy images, flashy sort of um, videos. We utilized social media rather than just stagnant websites and discussion forums for the first time. And I don't know how many people we radicalized, but I do know that in my period of operation, which started in approximately 2005 as a key charismatic preacher until 2011, when I was arrested two weeks after Osama bin Laden was killed, uh, we were connected to at least 15 different terrorist plots. Um, and that was during a period when we were becoming more aware that the primary threat was homegrown radicalization as opposed from attacks that were uh, plotted and planned by Al Qaeda abroad. Um, it was a particularly confusing situation for our law enforcement and counterterrorism uh, elements. And I was one of the, unfortunately, the primary actors that was um, able to innovate uh, in the jihadist space and left an uh, unfortunately enduring legacy uh, with regard to how do you take the ideology and the politics behind it and the modern era of strategic communications and become a bad actor uh, in a very effective way. Fortunately, uh, you you have turned your life around again, and I, and I do want to talk about that, but I want to just stay on something you, you mentioned in passing right now, which was law enforcement and their ability to deal with this homegrown terror in the United States. I want fast forward to 2021, what we're hearing right now under the Biden administration's intelligence services is that the number one threat to the United States is domestic terror emanating from white supremacists. What's your assessment on that? I think that when they, the justification for that statement is the analysis of number of people that have been killed by uh, homegrown domestic extremists uh, being more than the number of people that have been killed by homegrown jihadist extremists since 9-11. When you take out the 3,000 people that were killed on 9-11, however, that's the way that you arrive at that number. And when you further analyze the data, 
a lot of those don't appear to actually be deliberate terrorism attacks if they're defined under the law. And that's a complication. Now, I will also suggest that the problem with that perception is that all of the efforts that we did to curtail homegrown jihadist extremism actually made the problem worse. And they in what the way? Muslim in what way? What do you mean by that, Jesse? Well, a lot of people critiqued what were called uh, the law enforcement approaches that utilized informants to uh, to uh, investigate people that were seemingly radicalizing. But a lot of times the informants would, because American law is a little different, they would create sort of opportunities for individuals to engage in acts of terrorism. And then if the individual agreed to go with it, it would lead to a material support charge and lead to their incarceration. Um, we have seen the presence of informants in the Michigan plot that is largely responsible for creating a great wave uh, of interest in domestic radicalization because it targeted Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Now, as the case goes to trial, we find out that there were, in the same manner that jihadists uh, uh, were sort of infiltrated and interdicted by informants, that there was an, uh, uh, more than 50% of the people involved in the plot were informants. We also have the confirmation that there was the presence of informants amongst the most radical elements of the quote unquote insurrection on January the 6th. Um, and so now the conservatives in general, but also the most radical elements of the right wing have started to point out the same fundamental critique. The perception in the minds of the American Muslims was not that they were doing investigations so that they could establish uh, counterterrorism, but that they were stigmatizing and labeling all American Muslims as potential terrorists if they were, in fact, uh, practicing their religion. That's the same perception that is now creeping into the mainstream conservative population. And I'll be quite honest with you. Um, the critique is legitimate. Yeah, I, it's a very it's a very fine line, I think, uh, that law enforcement has to walk. Um, but at the same time, that's their job. And uh, and so it's it's interesting for me um, to hear this feedback, because, again, this this is where under the Biden administration, our intelligence uh, services seem to be going towards, which is um, kind of diminishing the threat of radical Islam here domestically in the United States and focusing much more exclusively on the threat of white supremacy. And what I wonder is why our intelligence services can't do both at the same time. Um, I want to I want to ask you also about um, mosques in the United States. So at the same time uh, that the FBI and others in the United States were focusing post 9-11 on, on trying to curtail any further radical Islamist attacks on the country. That was a time when they started to also monitor what was uh, being preached inside mosques. And then eventually organizations like CARE pushed back on that. And we saw places like New York City, uh, Democratic Mayor Bill de Blasio then uh, ended the policy of, of NYPD's terror unit um, actually going into mosques to, to again, monitor what was being um, taught and what was taking place inside mosques. Can you tell us a little bit about your own experiences on what's happening in mosques in the United States? The mosques in the United States, when I was a resident of New York City, um, I would say in retrospect are worthy of monitoring for many reasons. Um, predominantly because the narrative that is espoused by the leadership of the American Muslim community is somewhat hypocritical. They would never say what is said on a pulpit in public because it would be politically incorrect and would draw a lot of controversy. The anti-Israeli, anti-Zionist sentiment is a cloak for uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, the conversations that are held on the periphery uh, in small collective numbers amongst those that are most affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood, including the leadership of CARE, um, are uh, quite distinct from what is stated in public, where there's this representation that they believe in a pluralistic society. They believe in a pluralistic society and only in so far as it's compatible with Islam. And the ultimate ambition doesn't have to necessarily be to establish Sharia law uh, in the United States, but to shift policy in a direction that is conducive for the Islamicization of the Middle East 
And they've been able to craft a very a very interesting alliance with the far leftists that empathize that because of their anti uh, American sentiment, not realizing that everything that fundamentalist Muslims believe in would go far against their own views and their perspectives. So it's largely a political. Jesse, ploy. I want to ask you though, in terms of what's being preached and discussed on the sidelines in in some American mosques, being politic, you know, being unpolitically correct is not, you know, it's not criminal activity as much as some in the left would like to make it. So. But what else is going on in some some mosques in this country that that would possibly be criminal activity? Well, contrary to popular belief, the majority of radicalization under the period of ISIS did not occur in the mosque. A lot of evidence exists that funding for groups like Hamas exists in American mosques. Uh, a lot of evidence exists that there will be funding for Taliban uh, aligned organizations and entities in both Pakistan. Uh, and Afghanistan. And this comes under the guise of humanitarian assistance. So as we see Taliban call for humanitarian aid, right, that will mobilize communities. Now, what's done with that money is a whole different story, right? And so there is mostly a need for funding to fund jihad abroad. It definitely occurs uh, with regard to uh, mosque community. And then with regard to back in the day, if we revert into a previous period when Al Qaeda was most active, and we look at like the attack on the World Trade Center that preceded 9-11, it was all organized out and by a charismatic preacher that was located in a general mosque in Brooklyn, one of the mosques that can no longer be monitored, right? And so uh, we do have precedent for uh, radicalization. So we should be really worried about activity in the mosques that funds that capability, particularly when we think about a future of the Middle East that is ultimately fundamentally important to the sustainability of the post-World War II liberal Exactly world. right. And, and I also want to say on the point of um, mosques and radicalization, and there's, there's at least one other case that I remember off the top of my head, which was the Orlando nightclub shooter, uh, apparently radicalized in a local mosque uh, where he lived in Florida. Um, I'd like to, Jesse, talk uh, a little bit more about your own odyssey. So, um, so you become an incredibly successful recruiter for terrorists and you bring this American viewpoint, um, the glossy magazine kind of, uh, way to recruit jihadists. And, uh, and then eventually, um, you find yourself under arrest. Can you tell us real quick the chain of events that brought you under arrest by U.S. authorities and that what happens next? It's hard to do so quickly. I'll do the best I can. Um, we were very good at walking the fine line of free expression and the communication of a threat until an ally or a member of our organization threatened the writers of South Park for portraying the Prophet Muhammad in the cartoon. Uh, that caused global controversy. It also broke the law. Uh, what happened as a result of that is a woman out in Seattle started a Facebook page called Everybody Draw Muhammad. She did it to protect free speech. The American Muslim community rallied against it. And as a consequence, Indonesia and Pakistan threatened to shut down uh, Facebook in protest. My allies who were actively recruiting and radicalizing with me in the United States, Anwar al and Samir Khan, but who had over the years uh, moved to Yemen and became somewhat of a leaders in Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, then decided that the English language jihadist magazine that I developed should respond to the South Park threats of my organization by publishing the first edition of what now is known as Inspire Magazine. Inspire Magazine in that first edition uh, had a direct death threat against the woman who started the Everybody Draw Muhammad uh, Facebook page. It had fatawa uh, or uh, verdicts and Islamic rulings on uh, why you should kill anybody who even insults the Prophet Muhammad. And then for the very first time, English language jihadist propaganda had a recipe. So because they were embedded with Al-Qaeda in the Raven Peninsula, they published an article called How to Build a Bomb in Mom's Kitchen. And that article has been used more so than any other uh, recipe. Uh, it's been used by right-wing extremists as well. Uh, to uh, uh, It's been used by the Boston Marathon bombers. It basically gave an ability to take the ideas and to act upon them in a recipe through which you could buy a pressure cooker in any Walmart and pursue to commit a terrorist attack. Uh, in the aftermath of that, I ran uh, to Morocco, where I lived for a year, started my process of de-radicalization, but ultimately had to pay for my crimes. I was arrested two weeks after Osama bin Laden was killed, uh, coming out of a, a, of a mosque in uh, Casablanca and sent back to the United States 
uh, for incarceration again, this time as a terrorist. So, Jesse, what what happened? Uh, what what made you change uh, your ways, your thinking, your entire life at that point? I, I, when I moved to Morocco running from the law, what I didn't realize is that because I was running from the law, I wouldn't be able to communicate with the charismatic preachers that I had aligned myself with for so many years. And what that did by extracting myself from the network is it, I didn't realize it, I do in retrospect, it allowed me to have contact with others and be more open to alternative views. Secondarily, talking to Arab millennial youth that wanted nothing to do with fundamentalist interpretations of Islam and that only wanted to see a society that was built on principles I had taken for granted my whole life, looking at the inefficiencies that were going on around me with regard to the government structures in Morocco and the inability to speak freely, the state controlled press, you know, I did start to realize that there's so many good things about the country that I hail from and the principles that it espoused. The Arab Spring broke out and there was widespread rejection in the immediate aftermath for this fundamentalism and much more so support for, particularly in Morocco, a more liberal society and reform. So, so interestingly enough, what you're saying is that exposure to average Muslims had this profound influence on you. I would say, sec I would secular, say secular Muslims, Muslims had right. this profound yes, influence yes. on you and made you appreciate America. Yeah, to some degree, um, uh, definitely it, it plants a seed. And then the process just continued to unfold from there. I, I didn't realize I would be arrested when that happened. I probably would have de-radicalized regardless, but it might have taken an arrest. I don't know, but I was arrested. And then I met a former cleric who I had uh, translated his uh, lectures in Arabic into English and used them to uh, incite. His name is Mohammed Fizazi, and he had de-radicalized in a Casablanca jail where I was incarcerated temporarily for five months. That was my first contact with a former extremist. When the Americans flew me back, I started to uh, crave free press, started to dive back into philosophical works, um, the books of our uh, top uh, academics and intellectuals, and learned how to think with what you call individuation think for myself again, instead of having to sit at the feet of a scholar and memorize and be told what to believe, I was able to believe myself and in process of doing that still retained an Islamic identity. So I was able to read the Quran for the first time and understand the fundamental distinction between practicing a rule followed based interpretation of a religion and spiritual substance. Jesse, you, you just said something really powerful. You said that you began to believe in myself, believe in myself as the words that you just used. Mm -hmm. You um, you went through a very hard childhood. It's something that um, I, as a mother, when I when I read about some of what you experienced as a child, it, it's it's heartbreaking. Do you think that a lot of people who get attracted to radicalism of whatever type and variety often have this um, this kind of childhood where there is abuse and and other. Uh, really heinous things that no child should experience? More so when it comes to domestic radicalization, somebody who's born and raised here. Uh, we do particularly have data that suggests that far right-wing extremists that radicalize have 64% of them have four or more what we call adverse childhood experiences growing up. Then, uh, and that, that rate is uh, extremely much higher than the rest of our base population, which is about 13%. And it's even higher than juvenile delinquents when surveyed uh, in, in institutional settings. So that's high. But yes, uh, adverse childhood experiences uh, can include not just being beat physically, but being emotionally beat and not having supportive uh, parents or having authoritarian parents. And a lot of the people that I end up working with that are raised in a culture that is um, authoritarian, so to say, uh, or can be authoritarian and can use physical force and discipline um, have a very serious rift with their parents that is projected into wanting to reject their secularism or their cultural habits and believe in an Islam that they believe is utopic because it's like a drug. It's like an opiate. It relieves them from their stress. Jesse, you know, in my time at the State Department, I was actually shocked when I learned the statistic that in Europe, uh, most of the radical Islamism and, uh, and terror activity is not being conducted by the Muslim immigrants to Europe who would be um, 
kind of the parents' generation who originally emigrated from the Middle East, North Africa to Europe, but it is their children who are often born in Europe who are conducting this activity. So I know our time is running out. I'd love to talk a little bit about policy prescriptions. Knowing all that you do and having um, personally undergone the experience of being radicalized and then freeing yourself of this ideology, what do you think Western governments need to do to address this threat? Well, in brief, the reason that that previous generation was not susceptible to radicalization is because they were coming from... uh, and a period of time when there was not a rampant uh, advance of or the resurrection of the black flag as interpreted by the jihadists and the return to Islamization was very limited in its influence in the Middle East. So they came here with a very different ideology. And then uh, they were able to acknowledge the value of capitalism and free society, right? Oftentimes when we look at radicalization trajectories, there's contact with progressivism or anti-imperialism or anarchism or far leftism. That was my case, too. That made me look for an Islamism that has now become very popular because it has synthesized uh, far leftist critiques of our society that are very utopic, an unconstrained vision, if you will, from Thomas Sowell. Uh, And so hating our own values and not being able to recognize with nuance that the development of democracy and the development of the free market is something that we should stand for and promote, we're no longer allowed to do so. So the longer that we drift away and critique the United States as the ultimate home of racism and discrimination, when in fact it is the society in the world that is least like this, right, then we might be able to build buffers. But with the rising influence of the more far leftist critique, and you're a second or third generation Muslim in Europe or in America, and you're exposed to this in youth, and then your identity starts to formulate as an Islamist, the two are combined and they're synthesized. And uh, definitely the momentum in our society and in all of our schools in particular is totally conducive to hating ourselves without any awareness of how ineffective, inefficient, and problematic and opposed to individual freedom and liberty, much of the rest of the world is. Being so idealistic and moving into a space where even gender is going to be challenged in our schools at at a predominant level, I think is basically self-destructive and very conducive to creating pathways uh, for radicalization of all varieties. I agree that America is really at a delicate moment in our history and we're on the brink And I certainly hope that uh, our audience will listen to your powerful words and that together we can fight back this trend in the United States and and really pull our country back. Jesse Morton, I couldn't uh, thank you enough for joining me on Global Perspectives. Thank you for having me. 